Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cafe Con Tampa Online. Uh, I am uh, broadcasting from a remote location, and um, we've got an exciting guest today, Kathy Durden, who really is one of the founders of Cafe Con Tampa, one of the early participants, and is very involved in the art world in lots of ways, as you'll hear in a minute, and had before that or, or connected to that a long career in consulting and all kinds of things. Uh, Kathy, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself. Sure, I don't know that I want to go that much into my consulting career because we'd be here all day and we're here to talk about art and the, the new normal. But uh, in the art world, I am, in addition to the other things I do, I'm also on the board of Tampa Bay Businesses for Culture and the Arts. I'm uh, Director of Operations of Florida Watercolor Society, having been its president in 2012 and I've been Director of Operations ever since. And I've been president of Tampa Regional Artists for quite a number of years. Uh, I'm also one of the coordinators of the Doodad Repurposed Culture Competition. So, and, and I you're, paint. Yeah, you're an artist yourself. You're a watercolor artist, correct? That's it. And I'm also a watercolor uh, art teacher. And I've been teaching virtually on Zoom since we shut down, too. And I just have to say this real fast. You have one of the, I think, one of the world's best collections of um, Russian artifacts. And can you just give us 20 seconds about that and what you're doing? Sure, sure. I have uh, a large collection of Russian decorative arts from Peter the Great to the Russian Revolution. Um, much of it is either uh, currently in storage at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts or there are pieces on display at the Hillwood Museum in uh, Washington, DC. And uh, there was a plan to do an exhibition at the Virginia Museum in Richmond in a couple of years, who knows how schedules have been impacted by the pandemic, but that was the plan. So it did travel for about four years. And it just shows you, I've known Kathy for 10 or 15 years and uh, we always had great conversations, but I never probed that deeply into all of her background. And it just shows you never know who you're sitting with at a table. And it's always good to ask more questions because there are so many really, really interesting people out there. Okay, Kathy, you're going to talk about uh, the the uh, tell us uh, the Florida Watercolor Society and um, and how you're having to take your conference virtual and how artists are using the virtual environment to communicate with uh, buyers. You take it sure. away. Buyers and everybody. So Florida Watercolor Society is one of the largest state-based watercolor societies in the country with over a thousand members stretching from Panama, from Pensacola to the Keys. So you can see that connecting to that large of an organization and, uh, and, and uh, getting engagement that, with that large of an organization with that big of a statewide reach is really difficult. Every year, our, we do a, ma a major exhibit and then we do a convention. And our convention is really unique nationwide. No, but no other watercolor society tries to do this. Uh, we bring together, we have a four, two four day workshops, two one day workshops. The convention itself is three and a half day, or yeah, three and a half days starting Thursday night. And we bring together between 450 and 600 people into a locations into a location uh, with three tracks of demonstrations and a trade show. It is a real, con real convention when you think of a convention, it's a convention. We book in big convention hotels. So we were planning this year to be in St. downtown St. Pete, which was going to be a celebration of St. Pete, all the museums in St. Pete. We were coming up with things we could do with every museum, et cetera, et cetera. Really big event. And our exhibit was going to be up at the Leaper Radnor up in Tarpon Springs. Uh, our exhibit, it brings together a hundred of the best watercolors in the state of Florida. One of our members, Dean Mitchell, is almost always in our exhibit, almost always a winner of one of our exhibits, and he was on Cafe Con Tampa last week. So that's the caliber of the, of the artists that we bring together in our um, exhibitions. Well, um, as I said, we were scheduled to be in St. Petersburg the week of September 22nd. And uh, when we shut down, we were basically a little bit more than six months out. So, and my role as director of operations is usually a pretty easy one. I'm in charge of doing contracts with the, vent, with the instructors and the juror and the hotels. And I started early on, we all started to get worried that, you know, bringing together that population of a convention and the only way it works is if you 
could bring that many people together because economically it doesn't work any other way, uh, was really gonna be problematic. So we reached out to our members to see how they felt. And this was in er very early April that we reached out to the members and asked them how they felt. And we got a lot of feedback that people were very nervous. So we felt that we needed to transition to virtual and we needed to do it quickly because the transition to virtual was going to be such a big thing. Now, I want to step back for a minute. Last year, we had sat down and started thinking, we really, because as I said, trying to connect with people across the state of Florida, when our only event, except for our exhib exhibition, and we had instituted a traveling show to get the exhibit to places that were otherwise, that we otherwise wouldn't hit, um, we weren't connecting with a large portion of the state. And if you couldn't physically be at convention, you were missing out for that year. So we had started to talk about, yes, we needed to develop a YouTube channel. We needed to start thinking about a digital pres presence, but that was something that, you know, we had a conversation, we had a conversation at board meeting, thinking, oh, this is a great idea. Who's gonna take charge of it? Oh, nobody really wants to take charge of it. Um, but uh, then we were like, oh, wow, we've got to get going. So we quickly scrambled, uh, surveyed all our members trying to, uh, trying to find out who actually had digital skills to, um, to film themselves and to create YouTube videos and um, started to develop a convention, uh, trying to bring together people, trying to also develop skills because we really needed to uh, develop skills amongst our um, art and uh, amongst our artists and in terms of being able to film themselves, et cetera, and be, be comfortable in this virtual environment because we wanted to be, we still wanted to have our workshops, we still wanted to have demonstrations, and we needed to have it engaging enough that people would want to come. So, Fast forward for it's been we've been at this for about three months. We are about ready to go live. Hopefully today our convention registration is up. We have uh, six days of demos and uh, we have two four day workshops and two one day workshops all virtual that we have scheduled for the week of September 22nd. The workshops are going to be earlier and after that in September. And uh, I think the feed the Funniest thing email I got was from our juror who um, who did decide he didn't want to do a workshop because he thought it was too complicated, and so we got somebody else. But I had I actually shot a demo uh, of a YouTube video here at the art center on how to how to shoot a YouTube video as an artist and what equipment to use. You know, get your selfie stick, get your cell phone, your iPad. Um, you know, maybe have a camera, uh, ring lights, et cetera, et cetera. Do you need a microphone? And the reaction was, it's actually easier than it looks. And so I think that's the feedback I've been getting. I had another conversation with another artist on Sunday, and that was the same reaction. You know, we were all initially very um, put off, scared, concerned, but now have started to realize that this is an easier way to connect to people because people can now see what you're doing from the comfort of their home. They're now not having to schedule a plane trip, a, um, a ex you know, hotel, et cetera, and, uh, and actually can uh, do this much more comfortably. One of the big uh, art organizations in, or art companies, Fabriano, which is an Italian paper company, annually does an a gathering in, in Fabriano in Italy in May, uh, where they bring together the greatest watercolor artists in the world. Well, you can imagine, you know, in May, they, they knew they couldn't do that. So they created the most amazing YouTube channel with, which went live the last week in May, uh, one week, probably six 
videos a day from artists all over the world, all shot live, all shot and then put on their YouTube channel. And the one that they thing that I'm, I'm really trying to think about how we can um, capture for our convention is they did a collective painting activity where artists literally all over the world, and when I mean literally, I mean literally all over the world from um, Asia to South Africa to South America, painted, filmed themselves painting and posted it on a Facebook page. And you could just go with either background music or some commentary, maybe you could understand it, maybe you couldn't, it didn't really matter. Just the whole warmth and optimism of everyone coming together was just so inspiring. And that's the kind of thing we want to replicate this year at Florida Watercolor Society. Kathy, let me put in a, a couple plugs. And first of all, an apology to everyone. I'm doing this remotely. I'm actually in a in a kind of a backpacker place in St. Augustine, showing my kids around the art and history of uh, Florida with uh, safe distancing and everything, of course. But um, and so the internet connection is not great. And if you see any lag, uh, I apologize for that in advance. Uh, thanks so much, Kathy, for everything. Uh, if you haven't already, if you're watching this, please hit the share button. We want to share this information as widely as possible with folks. And that's why we do this. And also, if you have any questions, post it uh, in the comment section underneath the or to the right of the video. Uh, Kathy, do you expect to get a much larger audience this year because of the because of going online? We don't know. We really don't know. You know, there's there's part of it that says, because we're our price point, I'll, I'm putting out a, a shameless commercial for Florida Watercolor Society. Our price point is $20 for members and $30 for non-members. We are cheap. So, our, but um, we hope, and what we've been told by our, because we did work with the convention uh, registration company, is that everyone else that has gone live has actually gotten bigger, uh, higher attendance because you don't have to uh, be physically there. And I can say that I've attended numerous um, art demonstrations between since shutdown of uh, artists uh, and, you know, people would be dialing in from Georgia, i.e. former Soviet Republic, Georgia, South, South Africa, all over the world to see demonstrations because you can now do this virtually. Kathy, um, we have a couple questions here, but I wanna ask you, so I imagine that St. Pete and Tampa Bay competed for this event because it would be prestigious to have it here. Um, are there any advantages to St. Peter, the Tampa Bay area, now that it's not gonna be here uh, in person? Gee, I don't know. Um, I mean, actually, I won't go we had always had trouble finding a venue in Tampa. So we were still hoping that in the next few years, we will be able to be in Tampa. We've always been, we've been at the Leap of Radnor every five years for the last 20 years. So we kind of traditionally go up there and uh, had never been in downtown St. Pete. We've worked our way down the Pinellas County from uh, up the, up by, uh, uh, Tarpon Springs to the uh, Feather Sound area and we're finally down in, in downtown St. Pete. We're really excited about being in downtown St. Pete and we will probably be back in downtown St. Pete in four years just because um, that's how it's worked out with our contract. Um, and there's a, there's a, as everybody knows, there's a strong arts community in St. Pete, uh, thriving arts community, great place to do events. Um, Tampa's art scene is coming back and, and we're all looking to try to figure out how to collaborate across the Bay on arts. Let me ask you a couple questions that have hit the floor here. Um, uh, Jen McDonald says, your, your watercolor demos on Facebook with TRA are great. How do you think things will evolve now that you have this capability to reach and teach people in their homes? I think that I will still be doing this uh, on my demos on Zoom. Uh, I, I, I started trying to go back uh, to live in-person classes last, uh, last month. And, uh, but I have a few students now who are not located here. And that's the benefit of doing this is that people can now do it. It's much more convenient to do it in your home. Now, the thing you do lose out is it's very difficult to 
get the interaction and I still appreciate the interaction. That's where we have to be a little creative using private Facebooks, uh, uh, pages to share our work or showing it on your screen or something like that. Um, but um, I'll be doing that and I'm gonna be posting paintings and, and uh, montages of what, I, what I'm doing uh, and, and I'm kind of addicted now to shooting videos of my work. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and tell us what your website is, because a few people are commenting about how great your work is, and that's not what you're here to do today, but, but your yeah. work is great, and so we should plug it. Where, where can people see it? Uh, my work is kathydurden.com, K-A-T-H-Y-D-U-R-D-I-N. And I must confess that I have been shamelessly bad at getting my website up up and uh updated because I've been so busy with this. I mean, that between uh, trying to work on the FWS convention, organizing things uh, as director of operations, I've been taking a lead role in this, you know, finding people to, to who can video one of my, one of my colleagues was down from Bartow, for example, took all his equipment today and went down to Lakewood Ranch to film somebody else. I mean, that's what we're doing now. We're putting stuff in cars and schlepping around and filming other people. Tell us, um, let's back up a second. You know, we had uh, Dean Mitchell a week or two ago and and you gave some great behind the scenes insights into his work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the watercolor industry, kind of the evolution of it? And and uh, you also, you and Dean both talked about how maybe oil paintings cost more than watercolor. I Can you, I think I know something about art, but I don't know as anything compared to you all. Can you just explain the different kinds of medium and, and, and how they're priced and, and what they represent? Well, I think a lot of that goes, and I'm, I'm now I'm talking as an amateur and not somebody who's really studied it, but a lot of it goes to the idea that watercolor was used as a sketching medium versus a permanent medium, particularly uh, with the great British watercolors of the 19th century, um, thinking about Turner, for example, uh, where a lot of artists would uh, you know, sketch in their watercolor and then use that as the basis for their oil painting. So, and the other thing was that watercolor pigments may not have been as permanent as the, or, or perceived as permanent. And works on paper are always regarded as much more fragile than works on canvas or board. So all of that tends to contribute to this idea that watercolor is a less valuable medium, if you will. Now, I personally believe that watercolor is a fabulous medium. It's very challenging. It's actually much harder to do than oils because oils, you can paint over it. Watercolor, if you screw up, you screw up and you just got to work with it. So um, uh, I love watercolor. I love the immediacy. I love how it looks. I've always you know, been inspired by, for example, John Singer Sargent, who did the most phenomenal, um, uh, impressionistic, very immediate watercolors that are so fabulous versus the, then that's the other thing, watercolors, a lot of the historic watercolors were ones that you really did very quickly versus an oil would be a big production on canvas. And you think about the big Sargent uh, portraits versus the Sargent watercolors, for example. And they, they are more permanent, right? I mean, they can last for a long time. There are uh, Asian watercolor paintings that have been around a couple thousand years, am I correct? Or... Oh, exactly, exactly. They're very, um, yeah, and the, and the change, the, the evolution of the chemistry, and now you're getting into things that I really don't know that much about, of the chemistry of the pigments are such that now you, you can actually look at all your pigments and check light fastness and make sure you don't pick something that is not, that's furtive, that's gonna go away. And you will go, you'll get things that are actually very light fast. Are there certain kinds of moods or feelings or subjects that you would, um, that you would paint in watercolor versus any, anything else? No, I think you can do either. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's more of a genre thing. I really think you can, you know, there are watercolors who are very expressive and there are very watercolors who are very tight. And what kind of paper is it on? Uh, it's on a rag paper, so it's on a handmade, it's on a, uh, uh, a archival rag paper made out of, uh, 
of bread. You know, so it's, it's uh, and it, some of them are on handmade paper too. So it's like cloth and, and paper mix, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. And it's acid free, which you were saying it's is- It's totally oh. acid free, so you're, it's not gonna do the, the deterioration. I actually have a, a Chinese watercolor uh, that does not have acid free painting paper that's hanging in my house and it's just deteriorating completely. Were there the certain paper countries- itself. Were there certain countries that did watercolor more than others? Uh, like, was it equally popular in Europe, Africa, Latin America, Asia, or were there certain parts of the world that did watercolor more? Do you know? Well, obviously, Asia is known for for the watercolor and ink painting, and then the British. The British really were the the British artists starting starting in the seven in the eighteenth and nineteenth century, and a lot of the the manufacturers that uh, we know of very well that are familiar names to artists like. Uh, Windsor Newton are British companies, um, but the biggest uh, paper manufacturer is Fabriano, and they're in Fabriano, Italy. So, and uh, just in case anybody's just tuning in, thank you. Please hit the share button so your friends can see this. The reason why we do it is because we want to share information widely. Uh, we're talking to Kathy Durgan about lots of different aspects of the arts, but in particular about watercolor. Um, and if you have any questions, please post uh, in the comment section underneath or to the right of the video. Um, Kathy, what, how big is the watercolor industry in Tampa and Tampa Bay? Are there a lot of watercolor artists around here? There are a lot of watercolorists around here. I actually was sending a uh, email out to watercolorists in the county, in the Florida Watercolor Society members from Sarasota North to Ocala. And I did not get Polk County, so I still have to get Polk County. And that was that those are just members of Florida Watercolor Society. And it was 325 people that I sent out an email to last night. So, yeah, it's a big group. And are there Facebook pages or other places that people should go if they're interested in learning about it or becoming watercolor artists? Sure. Well, obviously, go to Florida Watercolor uh, Society org. There are also regional state regional watercolor societies within our state of Florida. The Florida Suncoast Watercolor Society stretches from uh, uh, up in uh, Pasco County down to Punta Gorda. And uh, there's Central Florida Watercolor Society, Citrus Watercolor Society, you know, any number of watercolor societies. If anybody wants more information, they can text me. And I should Basically. do a shout out. There are several, there are several uh, Facebook pages that take the Cafe Contempa feeds when they're about arts, but one of them in particular is Artists United, which takes almost everyone. So thank you to them for, for doing that. Um, Kathy, I, I just have to ask this. So you had a very successful career in consulting and you don't want to go into any of that. Uh, and, and you seem to have made a lot of the right decisions at the right time. But at some point, uh, kind of in your early retirement, because um, you're, you're not very old right now. Uh, so you took some kind of early retirement. You decided you wanted to become an artist. Um, we see a lot of people doing that um, as they're trying to define themselves or redefine themselves. Can you talk about that experience and what advice would you have to people who are considering expressing their creative side? But find your passion. And one of the other things I do that like, we're not talking about is I'm actually a certified coach. And one of the things I really want to focus on is helping people find their passion and figure out what their passion is. And a lot of times when you uh, retire or step back from a business career and a very intense business career, you don't even know what you want to do. You just know you don't like what you were doing. So it takes a little bit of time to figure out what really turns you on and what you really want to do and what, what you're passionate about. Um, it's, take some experimenting, some exploring, some trying. But the other side of it is you can always do what you want it to do. There, nothing can stop you. And it just takes a little bit of, a little bit of practice and uh, activity and just, but find something that really engages you. And how long does that pro process or evolution take? Do some people, with some people, does it, does it take right away where they, they find their passion, they find their style? Or sometimes does it take years to find their style? Well, at one of our members is going to be featured on, the, on our uh, at Florida Watercolor Society is a guy by the name of Frank Spina, who retired, I think, maybe six, seven years ago. And he's now counted as one of the best watercolorists in the world. And he hadn't really started painting until he retired. And does do amazing stuff with citrus, like you, the most detailed paintings of citrus you've ever seen. He's based in Florida? 
Melbourne. Melbourne, wow. Yeah. Yeah, you'll Just have Google. to. Um, Google make Freaks sure, Fino. <laughs> make sure you give us some of the websites sites so we can so we can post some of these things and let other people know too um but you look at the evolution of artists like so i'm on the on the board of the dali museum for disclosure but you start with the dali early paintings and they look very different than the rest you go to the picasso museum and uh in barcelona you know it's it, it the evolution is different than than where he ended up um it does it does it take a long time or does sometimes do people just hit their style right away I think it takes a little bit of time to get comfortable in who you are and what you want to be and realize that you want to be yourself versus copying somebody else's style. And um, because you're more authentic if you are yourself and you are doing what you yourself, what really turns you on. So you have to think about what really engages you. And with painting, it's I, to me, I think it's easy because if you're in the middle of a painting and you get bored with it, well, this is something you shouldn't be doing. So it's easy to figure out, well, this is not the one I need to be doing. If I'm bored with this, I don't really feel like moving forward. Um, or if you're not engaged, you're not, um, not excited. And so you try different ways, you try different, you go to different workshops, you try different techniques and you find things that really engage you. How I asked Dean uh, Mitchell this a couple weeks ago, but how do you how do you go from selling a painting for a couple hundred bucks to France to selling it for several thousand to uh, art collectors? How does that transition happen? It takes a lot of work, and it takes um, it takes recognition of what you're doing, and it takes a lot of personal marketing, and it takes time. It takes. And you have to figure out how do you get recognized. One way is getting is joining organizations and uh, and getting recognized in exhibitions through exhibitions and awards, uh, both in the U.S. and internationally. If you if you get to that level, uh, some of it is is promoting your work and showing your work, and getting people interested in your work. And and we do hope that people, even in this virtual, and that's let's go back to the whole idea of virtual that artists are still out there trying to show their work and they're trying to connect with the public. So please go out there and look at art and don't be afraid to be engaged and to reach out to artists because they're still out there, they're still creating. Uh, art organizations are trying to do creative ways of connecting to you, the public. What Florida Watercolor Society did, for example, to raise funds for our Healing Arts Award, which uh, provides funds for a purchase of a painting, which will this year go to the Bay Pines uh, Veterans Hospital, is we called it the Creative Confinement Challenge. So everyone was challenged to create an eight by eight, eight inches by eight inches, so it's little, uh, with, since shutdown, of uh, how they felt uh, related to uh, COVID or the confinement. And those are now available uh, for purchase on the Florida Watercolor Society uh, homepage. So floridawatercolorsociety.org. That's awesome. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. Um, could you please, I know one of the things you're passionate about is the building that you're in right now. Could you just tell us in 30 seconds about that and how artists or buyers can interact with that? Sure, well, this is Tampa Regional Artists. This is the old Hyde Park Art Center. Uh, once the one room schoolhouse from uh, over by Gory, and this is a picture of children lined up at the, uh, if you can see, children lined up for lunch. And I'm here with the uh, Bay Area Art Exhibit, and I'm gonna flip my phone around and you can see this fabulous building. You can see the original schoolhouse doors in the, and the other side, and this fabulous exhibit, which is, um, online at tamparegionalartist.com and we are having our virtual reception. Uh, this exhibit was curated and jurored by uh, Lynn Whitelaw who retired from Leaper Radner. We're gonna have our virtual exhibit uh, reception next sun Sunday a week from now on the 12th uh, and it will be streamed on Facebook Live. We are hoping, we would love to be able to have people come in here to see it. We really had hoped uh, and decided to bring it in before the, uh, uh, before the numbers started going up. And so we're really still hoping we could get uh, two weekend events where people could come in here with masks on 
and view the exhibit because it is fabulous, but it is available online on the Tampa Regional Artists uh, website. Tampa Regional Artists, since the shutdown, again, trying to reach out to uh, the public, has done uh, three, four virtual exhibits in addition to this one since the shutdown. So we're all out, all our, these org organizations are out there trying to still be relevant. And the thing to remember, people out there, is that we, these art organizations have in many instances lost their source of revenue. And we still have bills to pay. We still have to pay for the utilities. We still have to pay for the insurance. And our main sources of income, which is our classes and workshops have gone away. So we're, we're looking for whatever people can uh, help us in terms of creativity. Uh, we're, we're looking for you all to engage with us. And one of the themes that we've had with many of our interviews during this time is uh, imagine the stay at home policy without the arts. Imagine almost everything, almost every form of entertainment that you engage with, even without COVID-19, but especially if you're at home, almost all of them involve the arts and creativity. So thank you to all the artists that are creating it. Hey, one other quick plug, you and Jack Wyatt and a bunch of others work on a program where you're passionate about getting kids excited in the arts and creativity. Can you give us 30 seconds about that so people will know about it as well and the importance of connecting kids to the arts? Sure, Doodad Repurpose Sculpture Competition, doodadoftampa.org. We are going to, we, we're gonna be, and we are at the Tampa International Airport. We, unfortunately, our installation was uh, March 4th, 13th and 14th. So you know what happened those days. We were really uh, banking on, the massive amount of visitors which would be able to see the exhibit walking by, it's installed right by the escalators going up to the long-term parking area. And uh, unfortunately, because of the timing, uh, they, as I said, the exhibit's still there, uh, but no one has, you know, very few people compared to what we planned to see it could see it. But we shot everything, it's, a vir it's on virtually again at the Doodad uh, website. There's a virtual gallery, a virtual walkthrough, and uh, please take a take a take some time and see that the kids were challenged this year to use um, snack wrappers and uh, plastic bags, and the theme was Dr. Seuss shoes are the places you'll go, which was perfect for the airport and they imagined all the places they went, both physically and emotionally. And it's a fabulous kids from uh, kindergarten through, tw through 12th grade. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for everything you do in the community. Kathy's one of those quiet leaders who does so much and, and nobody or most people don't know about it. So we're really happy that you're here talking to us today. Thank you for your help in, in starting Gavik on Tampa also and all the other arts groups. Um, everybody who's watching, please uh, hit the share button so your friends can see. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're not, please find our YouTube channel and subscribe so you'll get regular updates from that. And Kathy, any final words, thoughts, any uh, websites you want to send us to? Well, I sent you to, th to three, and if you go to Florida Watercolor Society and look at our registration page, you'll see on the agenda, you'll see a lot of great artists and you can check them out too. And that there's links to their websites as well. All right, well, thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks everybody for watching. Have a great uh, 4th of July weekend. All the best.